Any tidings of my vessel has to remain in doubt. Uncertainty is still hope. Then in a low voice, Morel added, This delay is not natural. The pharaoh left Calcutta the 5th of February. She ought to have been here a month ago. What is that? said the Englishman. What is the meaning of that noise? Oh, 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 cried Morel, turning pale. What is it? What is it? A loud noise was heard on the stairs of people moving hastily into the half-stifled sobs. Morel rose and advanced to the door, but his strength failed him, and he sank into a chair. The two men remained opposite one another, Morel trembling in every limb, the stranger gazing at him with an air of profound pity. The noise had ceased, but it seemed that Morel expected something, something that occasioned the noise, and something must follow. The stranger fancied he heard footsteps on the stairs, and that the footsteps, which were those of several persons, stopped at the door. A key was inserted in the lock of the first door, and the creaking of hinges was audible. There are only two persons who have the key to that door, murmured Morel. Gockler and Julie. At this instant, the second door opened, and the young girl, her eyes bathed with tears, appeared. Morel rose tremblingly, supporting himself by the arm of the chair. He would have spoken, but his voice failed him. Oh, father, said she, clasping her hands. Forgive your child for being the bearer of evil tidings. Morel again changed colour. Julie threw herself into his arms. Oh, father, father, murmured she. Courage. The fair one has gone down, down, then, down then, said Morel in a hoarse voice. The young girl the young did not girl speak, speak, but she made an affirmative sign, sign with her head as she lay on her father's her. breast. And the crew? the crew? asked Morel. Saved, said the girl. Saved by the crew by the of the vessel, of the vessel that has just that has entered the harbour. Morel raised his two hands to heaven with an expression of resignation and sublime gratitude. Thanks, Thanks, my God, my God said, he. said he. At least At thou strikest me, me alone. A tear moistened Moist. the eye of the phlegmatic Englishman. Come in, come in, come in, said Morel, for I presume I you are all at the all door. At the door. Scarcely had he uttered these words than Madame Morel entered weeping bitterly. Emmanuel followed, followed her, and in the antechamber were visible the rough faces of seven or eight half-naked sailors. sailors. At the sight of these men, the Englishman started and advanced a step, then restrained himself and retired into the farthest and most obscure corner of the apartment. Madame Morel sat down by her husband and took one of his hands in hers. Julie still lay with her head on his shoulder. Emmanuel stood in the centre of the chamber and seemed to form the link between Morel's family and the sailors at the door. How did this happen? said Morel. Draw near, Penelon, said the young man, and tell us all about it. An old seaman, bronzed by the tropical sun, advanced, twirling the remains of a tarpaulin between his hands. Good day, Monsieur Morel, said he, as if he had just quitted Marseille the previous evening and had just returned from Aix or Toulon. Good day, Penelon, returned Morel, who could not refrain from smiling through his tears. Where is the captain? The captain, Monsieur Morel. He has stayed behind the sick at Pama. But, please God, it won't be much, and you will see him in a few days, all alive and hearty. Well now, tell your story, Penelon. Penelon rolled his quiz in his cheek, placed his hand before his mouth, turned his head and sent a long jet of tobacco juice into the antechamber, advanced his foot, balanced himself and began. Yeah, you see, Monsieur Morel, said he, we were somewhere between Cape Blanc and Cape Boyadar, sailing with a fair breeze, south-southwest after a week's calm, when Captain Gomar comes up to me. I was at the helm, I should tell you, and says, Penelon, 
What do you think of those clouds coming up over there? I was just then looking at them myself. What do I think, Captain? Oh, I think they are rising faster than they have any business to do, and that they would not be so black if they didn't mean mischief. That's my opinion, too, said the captain. And I'll take precautions accordingly. We are carrying too much canvas. Uh, vast uh, there, all, all hands. hands. Take in the studding sails and store the stole flying jib. It was time. The squall was on us, and the vessel began to yield. Ah, uh, said the captain. We have still too much canvas set. All hands lower the mains. Five minutes after, it was down, and we sailed under mizzen topsails and top gallant sails. Well, Penelon, said the captain. What makes you shake your head? Why, I says, I still think you've got too much on. I think you're right, then, said he. We shall have a gale. A gale? More than that, we shall have a tempest. Or I don't know what's what. You could see the wind coming like the dust at Montredon. Luckily, the captain understood his business. Take in two reefs in the topsails cried the captain. Let go the bowlings, all the brace. Lower the gallant sails. Haul out the reef tackles on the yards. That was not enough for those latitudes, said the Englishman. I should have taken four reefs in the top sails and furled the spanker. His firm, sonorous and unexpected voice made everyone start. Penelon put his hand over his eyes and then stared at the man who thus criticised the manoeuvres of his captain. We did better than that, sir, said the old sailor respectfully. We put the helm up to run before the tempest. Ten minutes after we struck our topsails and scudded under bare poles. The vessel was very old to risk that, said the Englishman. It was that, that did the business after pitching heavily for twelve hours, we sprung a leak. Penelon, said the captain, I think we are sinking. Give me the helm and go down into the hold. I gave him the helm and descended. There was already three feet of water. All hands to the pumps, I shouted, but it was too late. And it seemed the more we pumped, the more came in. Ah, uh, said I, after four hours' work, since we are sinking, let us sink. We can die but once. That's the example you set, Penelon, cries the captain. Very well, wait a minute. He went into his cabin and came back with a brace of pistols. I will blow the brains out of the first man who leaves the pump said he. Well done, said the Englishman. There's nothing gives you so much courage as good reasons, continued the sailor. And during that time, the wind had abated and the sea gone down. But the water kept rising, not much, only two inches an hour, but still it rose. Two inches an hour does not seem much, but in 12 hours, that makes two feet, and three we had before, that makes five. Come, said the captain, we have done all in our power, and Monsieur Morel will have nothing to reproach us with. We have tried to save the ship, let us now save ourselves. To the boats, my lads, as quick as you can, now, continued Penelon. You see, Monsieur Morel, a sailor is attached to his ship but still more to his life. So we did not wait to be told twice, the more so that the ship was sinking under us and seemed to say, get along, save yourselves. We soon launched the boat and all eight of us got into it. The captain descended last, or rather, he did not descend, he would not quit the vessel, so I took him round the waist and threw him into the boat and then I jumped after him. It was time, for just as I jumped to the deck, burst with a noise like the broadside of a man of war. Ten minutes after, 
she pitched forward. Then the other way, spun round and round, and then goodbye to the pharaoh. As for us, we were three days without anything to eat or drink, so that we began to think of drawing lots, who should feed the rest, when we saw La Gironde. We made signals of distress. She perceived us, made for us, and take us all on board. There now, Monsieur Morel, that's the whole truth on the honor of our sailors. Is not it true, you fellows there? A general murmur of approbation showed that the narrator had faithfully detailed their misfortunes and sufferings. Well, well, said Monsieur Morel. I know there was no time in fault but destiny. It was the will of God that this should happen. Blessed be his name. What wages are due to you? Oh, don't let us talk of that, Monsieur Morel. Yes, but we will talk of it. Oh, well then, Rimaus, said Penelon. Coquelin, pay 200 francs to each of these good fellows, said Morel. At another time, added he, I should have said, give them besides 200 francs over as a present, but the times are changed, and the little money that remains to me is not my own. Penelon turned to his companions and exchanged a few words with them. As for that, Monsieur Morel, said he, again turning his quid, as for that, as for what? The money. Well, well, we all say that 50 francs will be enough for us at present, and that we will wait for the rest. Thanks, my friends, thanks, cried Monsieur Morel gratefully. Take it, take it, and if you can find another employer, enter his service, you are free to do so. These last words produced a prodigious effect on the seaman. Penelon nearly swallowed his quid. Fortunately, he recovered. What? Monsieur Morel, said he in a low voice. You send us away? You were then angry with us? No, no, said Monsieur Morel. I am not angry, quite the contrary. And I do not send you away, but I have no more ships, and therefore I do not want any sailors. No more ships, returned Penelon. Well then, you'll build some. We'll wait for you. I have no money to build ships with, Penelon, said the poor owner mournfully. So I cannot accept your kind offer. No more money? Then you must not pay us. We can scud like the pharaoh and the bear poles. Enough, enough, cried Morel, almost overpowered. Leave me, I pray you. We shall meet again in a happier time. Emmanuel, go with them and see that my orders are executed. At least we shall see each other again, Monsieur Morel, asked Penelon. Yes, I hope so, at least. No, go. He made a sign to Coquelin, who went first. The seamen followed him and Emmanuel brought up the rear. Now, said the owner to his wife and daughter, leave me, I wish to speak with this gentleman. And he glanced towards the clerk of Thompson and French, who had remained motionless in the corner during this scene in which he had taken no part, except the few words we have mentioned. The two women looked at this person, whose presence they had entirely forgotten, and retired. But as she left the apartment, Julie gave the stranger a supplicating glance to which he replied by a smile that an indifferent spectator would have been surprised to see on his stern features. The two men were left alone. Well, sir, said Morel, sinking into a chair, you have heard all, and I have nothing further to tell you. I see, returned the Englishman, that a fresh and unmerited misfortune has overwhelmed you, and this only increases my desire to serve you. Oh, sir, oh, sir, cried Morel. Let me see, continued the stranger. I am one of your largest creditors. Your bills at least are the first that will fall due. Do you wish for time to pay? A delay would save my honor and consequently my life. How long a delay do you wish for? Morel reflected. Two months, said he. I will give you three, replied the stranger. But, asked Morel, 
Will the House of Johnson and French consent? Oh, I take everything on myself. Today is the 5th of June. Yes. Well, renew these bills up to the 5th of September. And on the 5th of September at 11 o'clock, the hand of the clock pointed to 11, I shall come to receive the money. I shall expect you, returned Morel. And I will pay you, or I shall be dead. These last words were uttered in so low a tone that the stranger could not hear them. The bills were renewed, the old ones destroyed, and the poor shipowner found himself with three months before him to collect his resources. The Englishman received his thanks with the phlegm peculiar to his nation, and Morel, overwhelming him with grateful blessings, conducted him to the staircase. The stranger met Julie on the stairs. She pretended to be descending, but in reality she was waiting for him. Oh, sir, she said, clasping her hands. Uh, Mademoiselle, said the stranger, one day you will receive a letter signed Sinbad the Sailor. Do exactly what the letter bids you, however strange it may appear. Yes, sir, returned Julie. Do you promise? I swear to you, I will. It is well. Adieu, mademoiselle. Continue to be the good, sweet girl you are at present, and I have great hopes that heaven will reward you by giving you Emmanuel for a husband. Julie uttered a faint cry, blushed like a rose, and leaned against the baluster. The stranger waved his hand and continued to descend. In the court, he found Penelon, who, with a rouleau of a hundred francs in either hand, seemed unable to make up his mind to retain them. Come with me, my friend, said the Englishman. I wish to speak to you. End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30, the 5th of September. The extension provided for by the agent of Thompson and French at the moment when Morel expected at least was to the poor ship owner so decided a stroke of good fortune that he almost dared to believe that fate was at length grown weary of wasting her spite upon him. The same day he told his wife, Emmanuel, and his daughter all that had occurred, and a ray of hope, if not of tranquillity, returned to the family. Unfortunately, however, Morel had not only engagements with the house of Thomason and French, who had shown themselves so considerate toward him, and as he had said, in business he had correspondents and not friends. When he thought the matter over, he could by no means account for this generous conduct on the part of Thompson and French towards him, and could only attribute it to some such selfish argument as this. We had better help a man who owes us nearly 300,000 francs, and have those 300,000 francs at the end of three months, than hasten his ruin, and get only six or eight percent of our money back again. Unfortunately, whether through envy or stupidity, all Morel's correspondents did not take this view, and some even came to a contrary decision. The bills signed by Morel were presented at his office with scrupulous exactitude, and thanks to the delay granted by the Englishman, were paid by Corkler with equal punctuality. Corkler thus remained in his accustomed tranquillity. It was Morel alone who remembered with alarm that if he had to repay on the 15th the 50,000 francs of Monsieur de Beauville, and on the 30th the 32,500 francs of bills, for which, as well as the debt due to the inspector of prisons, he had time granted, he must be a ruined man. The opinion of all the commercial men was that under the reverses which had successfully weighed down Morel, it was impossible for him to remain solvent. Great, therefore, was the astonishment when at the end of the month he cancelled all his obligations with his usual punctuality. Still, confidence was not restored to all minds, and the general opinion was that the complete ruin of the unfortunate shipowner had been postponed only until the end of the month. 
The month passed, and Morel made extraordinary efforts to get in all his resources. Formerly, his paper, at any date, was taken with confidence and was even in request. Morel now tried to negotiate bills at 90 days only, and none of the banks would give him credit. Fortunately, Morel had some funds coming in on which he could rely, and as they reached him, he found himself in a condition to meet his engagements when the end of July came. The agent of Thompson and French had not been again seen at Marseille. The day after, or two days after his visit to Morel, he had disappeared. And as in that city he had no intercourse but with the mayor, the inspector of prisons and Monsieur Morel, his departure left no trace, except in the memories of those three persons. As to the sailors of the Ferron, they must have found snug berths elsewhere, for they also had disappeared. Captain Gomar, recovered from his illness, had returned from Palma. He delayed presenting himself at Morel's, but the owner, hearing of his arrival, went to see him. The worthy shipowner knew from Penelon's recital of the captain's brave conduct during the storm and tried to console him. He brought him also the amount of his wages, which Captain Gomar had not dared to apply for. As he descended the staircase, Morel met Penelon, who was going up. Penelon had, it would seem, made good use of his money, for he was newly clad. When he saw his employer, the worthy tar seemed much embarrassed, drew on one side into the corner of the landing place, passed his quid from one cheek to the other, stared stupidly with his great eyes, and only acknowledged the squeeze of the hand which Morel, as usual, gave him by a slight pressure in return. Morel attributed Penelon's embarrassment to the elegance of his attire. It was evident the good fellow had not gone to such an expense on his own account. He was, no doubt, engaged on board some other vessel, and thus his bashfulness arose from the fact of this not having, if we may so express ourselves, worn mourning for the pharaoh and longer. Perhaps he had come to tell Captain Gomar of his good luck, and to offer him employment from his own new master. Worthy fellows, said Morel as he went away, may your new master love you as I loved you, and be more fortunate than I have been. August rolled by in unceasing efforts on the part of Morel to renew his credit or revive the old. On the 20th of August, it was known at Marseille that he had left town in the mail coach, and it was said that the bills would go to protests at the end of the month. And the Morel had gone away and left his chief clerk, Emmanuel, and his cashier, Gocle, to meet the creditors. But contrary to all expectation, when the 31st of August came, the house opened as usual, and Gokler appeared behind the grating of the counter, examined all bills presented with the usual scrutiny, and from first to last paid all with the usual precision. There came in, moreover, two drafts which Monsieur Morel had fully anticipated, and which Gokler paid as punctually as the bills which the shipowner had accepted. All this was incomprehensible. And then, with a tenacity peculiar to profits of bad news, the failure was put off until the end of September. On the 1st, Morel returned, and he was awaited by his family with extreme anxiety, for from this journey to Paris they hoped great things. Morel had thought of Donglard, who was now immensely rich, and had lain under great obligations to Morel in former days, since to him it was owing that Donglar entered the service of the Spanish banker, with whom he had laid the foundations of his vast wealth. It was said at this moment that Donglar was worth from six to eight millions of francs and had unlimited credit. Donglar then, without taking a crown from his pocket, could save Morel. He had but to pass his word for a loan, and Morel was saved. Morel had long thought of Donglar, but had kept away from some instinctive motive and had delayed as long as possible, availing himself of this last resource. And Morel was right, for he returned home crushed by the humiliation of a refusal. Yet on his arrival, Morel did not utter a complaint or say one harsh word. He embraced his weeping wife and daughter, pressed Emmanuel's hand with friendly warmth, and then going to his private room on the second floor, had sent for Cochle. Then, said the two women to Emmanuel, we are indeed ruined. 
It was agreed in a brief council held among them that Julie should write to her brother, who was in garrison at Nîmes, to come to them as speedily as possible. The poor women felt instinctively that they required all their strength to support the blow that impended. Besides, Maximilien Morel, though hardly two and twenty, had great influence over his father. He was a strong-minded, upright young man. At the time when he decided on his profession, his father had no desire to choose for him, but it consulted young Maximilian's taste. He had at once declared for a military life, and had in consequence studied hard, passed brilliantly through the Polytechnic School, and left it as sub-lieutenant of the 53rd on the line. For a year he had held his rank, and expected promotion on the first vacancy. In his regiment, Maximilian Morel was noted for his rigid observance not only of the obligations imposed on a soldier, <laughs> but also of the duties of a man, and he thus gained the name of the Stoic. We need hardly say that many of those who gave him this epithet repeated it because they had heard it, and did not even know what it meant. This was the young man whom his mother and sister called to their aid to sustain them under the serious trial which they felt they would soon have to endure. They had not mistaken the gravity of this event, for the moment after Morel had entered his private office with Cocle, Julie saw the latter leave it pale, trembling, and his features betraying the utmost consternation. She would have questioned him as he passed by her, but the worthy creature hastened down the staircase with unusual precipitation, and only raised his hands to heaven and exclaimed, Oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle, what a dreadful misfortune! Who could ever have believed it? A moment afterwards, Julie saw him go upstairs carrying two of three heavy ledgers, a portfolio, and a bag of money. <laughs> Morel examined the ledgers, opened the portfolio, and counted the money. All his funds amounted to 6,000 or 8,000 francs, his bills receivable up to the fifth to 4,000 or 5,000, which, making the best of everything, gave him 14,000 francs to meet debts amounting to 287,500 francs. He had not even the means for making a possible settlement on account. However, when Morel went down to his dinner, he appeared very calm. This calmness was more alarming to the two women than the deepest dejection would have been. After dinner, Morel usually went out and used to take his coffee at the Fossean Club, and read the semaphore. This day he did not leave the house, but returned to his office. As to Coqueleu, he seemed completely bewildered. For part of the day he went into the courtyard, seated himself on a stone with his head bare and exposed to the blazing sun. Emmanuel tried to comfort the women, but his eloquence faltered. The young man was too well acquainted with the business of the house not to feel that a great catastrophe hung over the Morel family. Night came. The two women had watched, hoping that when he left this room, Morel would come to them. But they heard him pass before their door and trying to conceal the noise of his footsteps. They listened. He went into his sleeping room and fastened the door inside. Madame Morel sent her daughter to bed and half an hour after Julie had retired, she rose took off her shoes and went stealthily along the passage to see through the keyhole what her husband was doing. In the passage she saw a retreating shadow. It was Julie, who uneasy herself had anticipated her mother. The young lady went towards Madame Morel. He is writing, she said. They had understood each other without speaking. Madame Morel looked again through the keyhole. Morel was writing. But Madame Morel remarked, what her daughter had not observed, that her husband was writing on stamped paper. The terrible idea that he was writing his will flashed across her. She shuddered, and yet had not strength to utter a word. Next day, Monsieur Morel seemed as calm as ever, went into his office as usual, came to his breakfast punctually, and then, after dinner, he placed his daughter beside him, took her head in his arms, and held her for a long time against his bosom. In the evening, Julie told her mother that although he was apparently so calm, she had noticed that her father's heart beat violently. The next two days passed in much the same way. 
On the evening of the 4th of September, Monsieur Morel asked his daughter for the key of his study. Julie trembled at this request, which seemed to her of bad omen. Why did her father ask for this key, which she always kept, and which was only taken from her in childhood as a punishment? The young girl looked at Morel. What have I done wrong, father? she said, that you should take this key from me. Nothing, my dear, replied the unhappy man, the tears starting to his eyes at this simple question. Nothing, only I want it. Julie made a pretense to feel for the key. I must have left it in my room, she said, and she went out. But instead of going to her apartment, she hastened to consult Emmanuel. Do not give this key to your father, said he, and tomorrow morning, if possible, do not quit him for a moment. She questioned Emmanuel, but he knew nothing or would not say what he knew. During the night between the 4th and 5th of September, Madame Morel remained listening for every sound, and until three o'clock in the morning she heard her husband pacing the room in great agitation. It was three o'clock when he threw himself on the bed. The mother and daughter passed the night together. They had expected Maximilian since the previous evening. At eight o'clock in the morning, Morel entered their chamber. He was calm, but the agitation of the night was legible on his pale and careworn visage. They did not dare to ask him how he had slept. Morel was kinder to his wife, more affectionate to his daughter than he had ever been. He could not cease gazing at and kissing the sweet girl. Julie, mindful of Emmanuel's request, was following her father when he quitted the room. But he said to her quickly, Remain with your mother, dearest. Julie wished to accompany him. I wish you to do so, said he. This was the first time Morel had ever so spoken. But he said it in a tone of paternal kindness, and Julie did not dare to disobey. She remained at the same spot, standing mute and motionless. An instant afterwards, the door opened. She felt two arms encircle her, and a mouth pressed her forehead. She looked up and uttered an exclamation of joy. Maximilian, my dearest brother, she cried. At these words, Madame Morel rose and threw herself into her son's arms. Mother, said the young man, looking alternately at Madame Morel and her daughter, what has occurred? What has happened? Your letters has frightened me, and I have come hither with all speed. Julie, said Madame Morel, making a sign to the young man, go and tell your father that Maximilian has just arrived. The young lady rushed out of the apartment, but on the first step of the staircase, she found a man holding a letter in his hand. Are you not a Mademoiselle Julie Morel? inquired the man with a strong Italian accent. Yes, sir, replied Julie, with hesitation. What is your pleasure? I do not know you. Read this letter, he said, handing it to her. Julie hesitated. It concerns the best interests of your father, said the messenger. The young girl hastily took the letter from him. She opened it quickly and read, Go this moment to the Allée de Meillon, enter the house number 15, ask the porter for the key of the room on the fifth floor, enter the apartment, take from the corner of the mantelpiece a purse netted in red silk, and give it to your father. It is important that he should receive it before 11 o'clock. You promise to obey me implicitly. Remember your oath. Sinbad the Sailor. The young girl uttered a joyful cry, raised her eyes, looked round to question the messenger, but he had disappeared. She cast her eyes again over the note to peruse